Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. This week on the show, we're going to learn about plant medicines used to treat diarrhea and poisoning from eating toxic fish in French Polynesia. Our guest today is Dr. Francois Chassagne. Francois is a pharmacist and charge de recherche or research group leader at the IRD, which is the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. He's based in Toulouse, France. He graduated from the School of Pharmacy in Paris Descartes University in 2008, and he holds a master's degree in biodiversity, ecology, and evolution from Paul Sabatier University. During his studies, he became passionate about mycology and botany, and thus decided to explore their medicinal potential in various research projects. His first ethnobotanical survey started in Vietnam as part of a research program with the Hanoi University of Pharmacy in 2010. Then he carried out other ethnobotanical surveys in Cambodia and Laos before and during his PhD program, which he completed in 2017. Curious to understand the pharmacology and chemistry behind these traditional uses of plants and fungi, he undertook postdoctoral training with Dr. Guillaume Marti, who's an expert in metabolomics, and Dr. Guillaume Cabanac, an informatician, in 2017. And much to my great pleasure, in 2018, he joined the Quave Research Group with me at Emory University as a postdoctoral fellow, where he studied the antimicrobial properties of plant extracts. In 2020, he was selected by the French Research Institute for Sustainable Development to start his own group in the field of ethnopharmacology. And now he's developing ethnobotanical and pharmacological tools to validate the use of traditional medicines in developing countries and French overseas territories. It's so great to see you today, Francois. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you, Dr. Quave. What about you? I'm great. I'm great. Yeah. So why don't we start by just telling the audience a little bit about your field site that you discussed in this recent paper. By the way, for all the listeners, I'll put up the link to the paper, but it's called Polynesian Medicine Used to Treat Diarrhea and Ciguatera, an Ethnobotanical Survey in Six Islands from French Polynesia, which was just published this year in the Journal of Ethnic Pharmacology. So tell us about French Polynesia. Where do we find it in the world and how big is it? Yeah, so French Polynesia, uh, you can find it like in the Pacific Ocean, basically. And it's uh, it's far away from uh, Australia, like 6,000 kilometers far away from uh, Australia, um, in the middle of the Pacific uh, Ocean. And it's quite big, actually. It's like uh, 5 million square kilometers big. So it's really huge. And uh, you, sh- you should know that as well, and you should know that... Um, so among like the, the marine uh, area and the marine territory uh, from France, uh, it covers like it's it represents fifty percent of the marine area of France. Wow. So it's really uh, it's a really big territory. And in French Polynesia, there are like uh, more than uh, one hundred uh, islands. So in total, it's like one hundred eighteen islands, and seventy four uh, islands are in, uh, inhabited. So it's a they are, there are different places, different cultures, different languages, um, and among which you, you can find like five archip- archipelago. So um, in this ar- different archipelago, you have a, a specific language, specific culture as well. So it's yeah, it's really interesting to to work there and to to uh, to know more about wh- what kind of traditional medicine, what kind of traditional remedies they use uh, in their daily life. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so I can imagine if you have these different islands, different languages and cultures on different islands. Are they using plants in the same exact way or are there differences between these different cultures? Yeah, so that's something that I wanted to know first because there are are not so many uh, ethnobotanical um, work or data on on these different islands. So we do not know exactly what are the, the differences between between the use and the names of uh, different plant species in these different islands. But we know that, of course, since they have like different languages, they they call their um, remedies or their plants 
their plant spaces differently, uh, depending on the, the area, of course. Um, and so, yeah, that that was one of the the goal of also of the the studies. It, it was to to know more about about two different uh, area. The first one was the Society Islands. Um, the Society Islands it's the the group of islands where you can find Tahiti. So Tahiti, mm -hmm. uh, like the, the really main island, and Bora Bora as well for those who know Bora Bora. Um, let, me, let me stop for a second. So you get to do field research in Tahiti and in Boa Boa. That yeah. sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is actually. Um, so yeah, that's so. This is the the place, and basically in this area, in this group of islands, in this archipelago, you can find um, most of the like two thirds of the population, and so they have their own language, and their language is Tahitian, the Tahitian, and mm -hmm. and so I st I studied there, and I also decided to study another group of islands, which is like quite far from the Society Islands. Uh, we call them uh, the Marquesian Islands. Mm -hmm. And it's like a three hour uh, flight from uh, Tahiti. So it's quite far. Um, if you uh, place Tahiti in Paris, um, Mar the Marquesian Island, basically, you can find them in Sweden. So wow. um, it's really far away from the, the two different areas, quite far away from each other. And so, and in in, Mar in the Marques and Islands, they have like uh, specific languages as well, uh, two different languages, one specific to the north and another one specific to the south. And so, and the 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 culture is different. The, Geography is different. The, cli the climate, the climate is different. So um, there are different uh, things that are different, and that makes the remedies and the plant species um, different as well. Uh, used for in traditional, traditional medicine, different. Yeah. Nice. So what what is actually known so far about the medical ethnobotany of of French Polynesia is there is there much already established in the literature or is it kind of an unknown territory still? So um, most of the data that we have um, in French Polynesia regarding like the traditional medicine uh, that back that date back from uh, like the fifties or the sixties. Uh, so, um, so it was a, a pharmacist who did like different ethnobotanical survey uh, when he was uh, um, a military uh, in the territory, and so um, he 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 actually he did a lot of work and and what he we can we he made a, a book and and this book is quite is quite uh, um, like. Uh, informative and interesting. Uh, there are like different um, plant species, more than 150 uh, medicinal plant, plant species are recorded, reported in this book. Um, but except this uh, book, like which is now a bit old, um, there are not so many data. So mm -hmm. that's why it's also interesting to uh, study this area. Yeah. 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 And how does this tie into your job? Because this is something we have a lot of students that listen to this podcast, a lot of people that are interested in, you know, exploring different ways of, you know, becoming employed while doing ethnobotany and ethnopharmacology. So how does this kind of work tie into your job? So um, as, as you said, I work for the French National uh, Research Institute for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. So um, the aim of each uh, researcher in this institute is to help uh, developing countries, and in, in my case, uh, French overseas territory, uh, in our, um, to uh, develop their own research, but also to um, reach the 17 sustainable goals. Uh, and in my case, it's um, especially uh, we focus on uh, good health, well-being, uh, and the biodiversity conservation as well. So, um, thanks to what I'm doing with um, the medicinal plant, and sp especially trying to validate the use of traditional remedies, so that's what I'm doing. Um, we, we they can know more about the efficacy and the toxicity of uh, the remedies that they use in their daily life. So um, it brings something um, for them in, so they can uh, 
I mean, that's something important for them to know and to improve their, their health and uh, their well-being as well. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. So this is not just research that's for the sake of research and publishing in scientific journals, but it's really also targeted at returning this knowledge back to communities, back to healthcare providers within the country. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that's yeah, that's uh, the, the objective. It's to it's to uh, help them to to know more about that their remedies. And um, there, there there's something um, some people started to to um, integrate uh, the traditional medicine uh, inside the um, like I would say the the official healthcare system in French Polynesia, uh, which is quite. Uh, which is a bit different from France, but uh, since they have their own um, healthcare system, but and so some medical do doctors um, try to uh, integrate um, message therapists uh, in in the hospital in the main hospital of uh, French Polynesia, which is based in uh, in Tahiti. And um, this, this was uh, the, the first part of uh, this um, integrative medicine that they, they tried to promote. And so my job is also to, to, to help them to know more about the plants, not only the, the massage and what the traditional um, um, parts like the traditional massage, uh, but also to know more about uh, the, the remedies and the, the plant species that they use and, and, and this, kind, this kind of things as well. So yeah, so th th there are a lot of things to do actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. Well, that's great that they have, I mean, in the US, we don't have massage therapy integrated into our healthcare system. It's considered an out of pocket expense, oh, okay. um, which is very unfortunate because I think for people with, with especially with dealing with chronic pain or muscle pain, which is definitely me, <laughs> I have to, you know, I use massage therapy as one of my main, my main healthcare like um, tactics to, to, yeah. to maintain health. Um, but yeah, this is this is great. So let's let's dive into your research study. So you said that you mm. went to six islands. How many people did you interview, and what were the types of questions that you were asking them? Yeah. So in total, I asked um, one hundred thirty-three uh, informants. Uh, so as you said, so it was uh, they they were in six different islands. Uh, I worked in three islands from the Society Islands. So um, the name was, Ta of course, Tahiti and uh, Rayatea and, and Taha. And then I went to the Marquesian Island uh, where I visited uh, Nukuiva, Ivaoa, and uh, Tawata. So in these six islands, I tried to um, interview more or less like in each island, uh, 20 to 30 people. Mm -hmm. So it took me about two months, uh, two months um, to, to, to do that. And so I asked them different questions, of course. And among the questions that I asked uh, you, of, so I tried to, to know more about the, their age, their the gender, the uh, religion, and, and where, of course, uh, where they are from and all these kind of things. Um, basically, that, that's, basic uh, social demographic data but it's yeah. really important to know that uh, since uh, for example first we, we want to know what are the mean age of traditional healers we want to know um, uh, if the the, um, the user of traditional medicine are um, male or female or we, who um, uh, like holds the this knowledge so that's why we we need uh, this uh, this data and the second uh, part of the questionnaire was uh, focused on um, the description of the disease. And so, as you said, I, I focused on diarrhea and ciguatera. So ciguatera is a, um, uh, a type of food poisoning uh, that you get when you eat uh, fish contaminated by ciguatoxin. And this toxin is produced by um, algae, algae, so algae. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, algae, sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, this, and basically the fish eats this algae and then another fish eats the small fish that have eaten this algae. And then there is a, like a link like that. And step by step, um, the, um, the contamination get bigger and yeah. the toxin, uh, like his the quantity of toxin is higher in the um, and 
And at the end, the, the, we eat uh, this type of fish and we, and we get sick. And there are like various disorders uh, that, we, that we have when we get ciguatera, uh, especially uh, diarrhea. So that's why I linked then this uh, yeah. disease to, to mm -hmm. the diarrhea illnesses as well. Um, neurological disorders and cardiovascular disorders. So that's, an, and it's like kind of endemic to the Pacific Uh, so that's a huge, um, a huge uh, d d disease. And so my uh, one part of the questionnaire uh, focused on on this uh, the description of this disease, like diarrhea and ciguatera. And I wanted to know if people knew about uh, the symptoms, the cause of uh, diarrhea and, and ciguatera. Um, and I wanted to know if they. Um, can use some treatment to prevent uh, this, uh, these disorders if they give advice to the patients that they um, see. Um, and so um, that was uh, one, the, one of the parts of my questionnaire. And uh, the third part of the questionnaire was focused more on the description of the remedies. So basically, I um, so they I asked them about the uh, name of the plant species, the so the vernac vernacular names, uh, local name of course, um, the part of plant used, the method of um, preparation, the method of administration, and um, of course um, how the posology, so the duration and the posology. So that's what I did. Yeah. That's great. And were you interviewing primarily healers or did you speak to just general people in the community as well? So I, so um, since I did not know about French Polynesia, it was my, my first time basically in French Polynesia at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I decided to interview um, everyone because I wanted to know if, if there were uh, differences uh, between the users, the users of traditional medicine. And, and actually I found some differences and that's quite different. That's quite interesting. Um, so most of the people like uh, think that they are like specialists and non-specialists. So by specialist, I mean specialist in traditional medicine, but uh, like I would say like experts and mm -hmm. non-specialist is it's like us. We know uh, that uh, lemon and uh, honey is good for cough, but uh, that's more or Got less the, yeah. the, the basic <laughs> that we know and we don't know much. Um, so, and I, I found that in, in French Polynesia, I found that there are a third category of, uh, of uh, users of traditional medicine, and I uh, call them the knowledgeable. And they are between the non-specialist and the specialist, and they still have knowledge. They still uh, treat uh, their families. Sometimes they also advise um, people outside of their family. Um, and so, and, but, uh, They can be like in a uh, in a training process, or they are, uh, or sometimes they, they they are not so known. Was they only do that in their family, even if they know a lot of things and they have a book of remedies, uh, mm -hmm. but they do not share to other people. So I try to to um, so in in this uh, article I um, I define exactly uh, what how I uh, classified the the three uh, group of uh, users. Of traditional medicine and but it was quite interesting to see that basically there are people who knows but we cannot really uh, call them traditional healers right yeah yeah they're not were like, these in yes, the household yes. were, what was their status in the household I, i've noted in a lot of the work i've done in the balkans and even in the mediterranean it's often the female head of house like the eldest grandmother that kind of treats all the family is that similar in french polynesia or, or are there others that hold the knowledge Yeah, so yeah, that's more or less the same. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the, yeah, the, the, the women, they, they hold the knowledge basically and even among the traditional healers. So um, among the third category, I mean the, the three categories of uh, users of traditional medicine, it's female uh, women who uh, hold the, the, the knowledge. And uh, there are um, some, but for Ciguatera, since uh, it's, um, It's a disease that you get when you eat fish, and basically it's uh, men who get the fish in the sea uh, most of the time. So um, they start to eat the fish like uh, like before uh, uh -huh. taking. 
um, going going home and, and and cook it. So so that's why they know more about um, about uh, this uh, specific uh, treatment. Um, but in general, it's women who know who hold the knowledge, yeah, the traditional knowledge. So with ciguatera, um, just I just want to take a moment to explore that a little bit more. So this is a disease that is caused by bioaccumulation of a toxin that's passed from algae that are eaten by little fish, which are eaten by bigger fish and bigger fish, and then the humans eat. Um, how, how immediate are the side effects of, of this disease? You mentioned, you mentioned diarrhea, but also a neurologic dysfunction as well. Like, is it, is it pretty immediate or does it take time to yeah, to so um, diarrhea, the gastrointestinal disorders basically they arrive like quite quickly, like mm -hmm. within a few hours. Then um, after that, you it uh, like the neurological uh, disorders start uh, maybe after a, a few hours. Sometimes it it starts after a few days, and it can last for for months basically for, for wow. weeks at least and sometimes for months. Um, and one of the most uh, typical um, symptoms uh, of ciguatera is the reversal of hot and cold sensation mm -hmm. so when you touch something cold you feel hot and when you touch something hot you feel cold that's weird wow. right <laughs> wow <laughs> so yeah it's not funny but that's what uh, some people uh, get and uh, in total there are like more than 170 different symptoms wow. uh, reported uh, for ciguatera so, you know, and the most important thing is that there, there is no official treatment. So um, right. there is one treatment which is used, but it's only symptomatic. So it does not treat, does not um, uh, avoid the disease, uh, but it only cure like the symptoms that you have. And so that's why medicinal plants can really um, play uh, a role uh, to to uh, treat to avoid um, ciguatera. So um, yeah, our job. I think our job is really important to to find like new cure for for ciguatera. This disease, absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about the plants. How many? You know, do you have a sense of how many different plant species are used to treat this disease? And are these wild? Are they grown in gardens? Do they carry them with them on fishing trips? I mean, there's. Like, how are these integrated into mitigation of this disease? Yeah, so um, first of all, um, one of the, the most in interesting points uh, is that um, the, the, the plant species that are used for ciguatera and diarrhea uh, are not uh, indigenous, meaning that they are not from the islands, but most of them come from outside the island. They were introduced by, uh, by people. And... Um, if, and it actually it makes sense because if you uh, look at the history of Polynesian people, they um, they did not arrive like uh, in in this island a long time ago. It was only one thousand years ago, which is not which is mm. quite like new. Recent, you can say that, yeah. yeah, quite recent. And uh, basically, it, it is known that they started their journey um, like four thousand five hundred years ago from Taiwan. Uh, I mean the Polynesian people, and they and they um, by boat and they uh, by boat they um, went from island to islands uh, and arrived uh, finally in Polynesia. But it took times and and many yeah. different uh, journey to to do the, to 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 do the, this. And of course, when um, they took their boat, they brought with them a lot of many plants, many plant species. Uh, not only to treat themselves, but also to eat, because yeah. they did not know what they will find in in the island that they will uh, they will see. So um, they will in, 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 inhabit. So um, of course that's um, that's that's why um, the, um, the the medicinal plant species that they use now um, come from uh, this different journey that they did and they come from everywhere basically and from Asia and from uh, the different parts that they visited uh, along uh, their journey. Um, so that's really interesting. So that's the, the first point. And of course, um, since, uh, as you already know, um, European uh, colonized uh, these islands um, about 250 years ago. 
So during this colonization, um, they um, European brought uh, different plant species as well that they introduced. And so the, the Polynesian pharmacopoeia rely on these different introduced plant species. Interesting, so, from different cultures as well. So you have a, a real mix of, of, of origins and, and histories of each of these species. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the, the first uh, thing, uh, which is like quite interesting. And for Ciguatera, I found that they used about uh, 30 plant species, 30 different plant species, but there are um, some plant species that are really uh, highly, highly used. Like for example, um, pomegranate. Um, pomegranate is quite used, and it's not uh, pomegranate. You can find it everywhere, basically. You know, really. Uh, in, <laughs> so, and they use it. They, they use it, and it's the the, the most cited, uh, reported um, plant species for treating a ciguatera. So um, that, that's um, and they also use uh, ginger. Which is uh, that's so. This one is also quite famous. Um, and for diarrhea, they used uh, guava, gua the guava tree. The guava tree is also uh, a plant species that you can find everywhere in the tropics, in Asia, in Africa, uh, and in South America as well. So, um, no, when you say that they're using guava and ginger and pomegranate. Are they using the parts that we typically think of as food ingredients? Or are they using other parts? Like, are they using the fruit or are they using the leaves or the bark or what parts of the plant are they using? So it depends. It depends on the plant, the plant species, of course. Mm -hmm. But for pom, uh, for pomegranate, they use the fruit. They mainly um, use the fruit. Mm -hmm. For uh, guava, they use the leaves. Okay. And they do not use so much the food. Um, also, they know that if you eat the food, you get constipated, so you can still treat the diarrhea. But mm -hmm. they prefer to to use the the leaves. Uh, they told me that it's more more effective. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it really depends on the um, on the plant uh, that they they use. Uh, and sometimes uh, they use bark, they can use some bark as well, um, flowers. Um, they they use all parts of the, the plant species. It, it depends on the plant species that they uh, cite or that they report, but yeah, that's what they do. So for all of these plants that they're using to treat ciguatera, are, are these primarily aimed at stopping the diarrhea or are there any remedies that they take with the thought that they can help with some of the neurologic problems? Uh, you mean if there, there is, that's, you, you asking me if they cite me, how the-, the, the Yeah, how the, the plant plants works. Work? Do they say this helps with the neurologic problems or do they just say, no, I use this in general? Yes, it did not really uh, tell me. I, I think I don't know if they really know how the, the, the plants yeah. work. Most of the time they did not precise that. Um, but uh, they, because they um, sometimes they think that the remedy can have an effect on uh, the, the cold. Sometimes they, to they told me that um, you get diarrhea because the, your belly is cold, especially in, like around the navel, the navel. And mm -hmm. so um, when it's cold there, you get diarrhea. And when you take a specific plant species, uh, you can treat this cold and thus you and, and then uh, the diarrhea di disappear. So um, it's more um, about cultural um, things and cultural tradition. Um, I yeah. think that, yeah, that's that's how they, they think, but they do not uh, see the pharma pharmacological action of the of the plant, I think, or well, not so much, not so much. Yeah. Well, when you think about you know, going back to your laboratory and looking into the literature on the known activities of some of these, because pomegranate's been studied well, ginger's been studied well. I'm assuming guava has some some studies. Like, what were you finding? Do you do you do you find that there there is a scientific basis for the utility of these plants in treating these types of issues? Yeah, definitely. Actually, what they do is is it, it does make sense. Actually, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, guava tree is quite known uh, to treat. So, as I said, it, it's it's known to to be used for diarrhea in different countries all over the world, and and there are studies, uh, especially clinical trials, uh, that prove that guava uh, is uh, effective 
for diarrhea. Um, wow. So yeah, that's yeah, that's clinical uh, studies, like yeah, clinical studies right. exactly. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of uh, in vitro and in vivo studies com confirming uh, this also these uh, cl clinical studies. So um, yeah, so that's that's really interesting to see that they they do not use uh, uh, random plants plants. Uh, they use like plants that really work. Um, yeah, for ciguatera, it's more difficult more difficult to find. Uh, plants that have uh, an effective action because we do not um, work or we do not study um, the plant species or we didn't, did not much did not much uh, did uh, we, we did not do much studies on um, on um, plant species uh, for ciguatera so um, it's more difficult to find uh, data on, on, on this plant species, but uh, the only one which is quite known it, and it's uh, Heliotropum, it's a, it's a scientific name, sorry, uh, um, Heliotropium arboreum. So that's the, the scientific name. It's a tree that you can find like along the, the, the coast uh, near the sea. And uh, the leaves are used for treating ciguatera. And it's not only in French Polynesia, it's also in different countries, uh, in, in different, different islands in, um, in the Pacific, such nice. as New Caledonia as well, or Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. they, they, used, um, they use this, uh, this tree. And uh, some, so some, some people uh, did uh, some research on this particular specific plant species, and they uh, identified uh, bioactive compounds, the rosmarinic acid, which is, uh, which is effective against ciguatera. So it's they did not prove it in clinical study, but they did it uh, like in vitro, so meaning in, laboratory in, uh, in laboratories. Yeah. yeah. So um, makes me so wonder about rosemary then, because you find a lot of rosemary acid in rosemary as well, the common yeah. spice. But I, I, I don't know if rosemary would grow well in that habitat. Possibly not. I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a, a good point. Actually, we 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 find a lot of um, rosmarinic acid in in uh, in rosemary. So we could uh, maybe we could try. They could try to to use it uh, as a as a remedy if they could not cannot find the other tree. Uh, why not? I don't know if the yeah. you also have to think about the quantity that you can find in the plant and how to extract it. So yeah. maybe the method of preparation have to be um, like who visited maybe yeah no the the i think you're you're absolutely right with the means of preparation is always important and um and of course there are so many other compounds in these plants you may have one lead bioactive compound but there might be others in the plant that assist yeah. or act in synergy um with your you know with your other compounds that's yeah. great well, um, when it when it comes to next steps, Francois, what are you thinking for this project and, and future projects in the region? Um, what what comes next? Yeah, so when I was there and I did this study, um, I realized that people uh, used a lot of remedies for children. So mm -hmm. that's why they told me basically uh, every time when I um, interviewed people they, they told me okay yes I used uh, um, remedies for ciguatera and diarrhea but I especially used uh, traditional medicine for treating children illnesses mm -hmm. so um, the the next step and I already started this um, a, another survey a second survey um, this year and I try to interview people um, about their the remedies that they used uh, they use for uh, children illnesses. And actually, there are a lot of interesting data, and I, I hope I can share this data with you uh, during maybe another uh, <laughs> meeting or another podcast. Podcast, why not? <laughs> but yeah, there are there are there are a lot of things to 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 say. Uh, around that uh, it's 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 crazy it's even more interesting than what i did last year uh, with ciguatera and, uh, and diarrhea so yeah. yeah well and you know diarrhea is such an important childhood illness too i mean in addition That's to right. affecting adults there's i don't That's know right. i mean it's one of the leading causes of death for children under the age of five across the globe i mean it's yeah it's a it's a really serious problem that you know, it's important to have access to local medical care for. So I think this kind of work is really important um, for sustainable development initiatives and, and you know, 
validation of traditional medicine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for, well for coming on the show. This is really cool. You and if you ever need a field assistant or an extra set of botanical <laughs> eyes, I mean, I wouldn't turn down a trip to French Polynesia. <laughs> so, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded today on Zoom. I want to thank our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth, for pulling together a great show. And thank you to our listeners who tune in every week to learn more about the amazing interactions between nature and food and our health. You can catch this episode and all of our others on our website at foodiepharmacology.com. And you can also catch the video version of this episode at our YouTube channel at Teach Ethnobotany on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.